Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's high speaking. Uh, right now is 3.03 p.m. So we would like to start a webinar um, right now. First of all, thank you very much for everybody to come and join with us today. My name is Phạm Hoàng Hải, Executive Director of the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam. And once again, welcome uh, to all of you to joining back to our webinar series. And we are very glad to see that uh, our series of webinar is uh, growing attention and interest toward the, um, um, let's say the, the community of entrepreneur and the business uh, and the firm, the company that's doing business in Vietnam or for those who is um, like to approaching the business in Vietnam. And the reason why we're here on today is uh, to talk about the very uh, important issue uh, aspect of the company. And most of all, it's even more, even more uh, important to own the business, to own the company during this particular period, which we're talking about the hiring challenge in Vietnam and how to grow human capital in the pandemic. So, well, uh, before going into the, uh, the detail, all of us know that uh, it's, it's, I, I would say that it's, um, it's not necessary to, to talk about how tough this period that we are going through. And, uh, but we all know that um, all modern business right now is, uh, is changing. Nothing is like before. Uh, on the company, we are trying to, let's say, survive. We're trying to maintain uh, our cash flow as, as good as possible. I, I'd like to say not good, but let's say let's try as good as possible. And um, one of the issues that is very uh, critical, become critical to, to the companies besides uh, surviving, uh, maintaining the client, finding the new uh, business model and also finding new client is also how to maintain and, uh, our human resources and how to um, find a new one. Many of us uh, during this pandemic uh, have to reduce our staff or have to somehow uh, contain the expand on the human resources. And hoping that um, when the business is coming back or since somehow we have to, let's say, grow our human capital again, but how to grow uh, in the most effective way. And that's the reason why we're here to, uh, uh, to bring an expert that we hope uh, the answer of this, uh, this expert can help you to find a solution for your own firm, for your own business. And, uh, and that's this. Here we are. Uh, the speaker we are very gladly to, glad to have today is uh, Mr. Giuseppe Liamele, uh, Managing Director of Vin, uh, Vin, uh, Vinasia, and also Mr. Chung Nguyen, the Business Development Executive of Vin, uh, Vinasia. Talking about Vinasia is also uh, they are a company member of iCharm and also an expert, a company expert in HR industry. And uh, they were also organized to, uh, with uh, iCharm, um, a seminar on HR um, back to a few months ago on Black, Black Swan, how to become stronger under uncertainty. Well, it's also a, a theme on uh, how to, let's say, focus on human resources during the pandemic. And not to take your time any longer, I would like to uh, pass uh, the floor to Mr. Chung Nguyen from Vinasia, who will start the introduction about uh, in the company, the importance of, of the human capital. And um, I suppose that you all know, uh, uh, please during the, during the presentation, if you have any question, any doubt, any concern, uh, please raise your, uh, your question directly in the chat box right below and we will arrive and try to answer on uh, your question and uh, concern during the Q&A session. And um, here we go. So Chung Nguyen, the floor is yours. All right, yeah, thanks, Mr. Haifan. All right, yeah, uh, hi everyone. My name is Chung Nguyen. I'm the Senior Consultant and Business Development Manager at uh, Vinasia. So thank you very much again for joining our webinar today with the topic of the hiring challenge in Vietnam, how to grow human capital in the pandemic. Uh, our the four sessions below, uh, firstly, we'll talk about who we are and the importance of the human capital, then the analysis that we have on our clients. And then uh, Mr. Giuseppe Yamile will continue with the two main trends that we discovered uh, during our analysis and uh, give us some tips for the future. So firstly, let's discover who we are and the importance of the human capital in Vietnam. 
Um, so Vinacia is a Vietnamese company, which is part of the Axia Group, an Italian premium HR consulting firm. Uh, it has its presence around the world with the headquarter in Milan, Italy. So founded in 1990, we have been having more than 30 years of history until now. And um, as Vietnam has been developing rapidly during recent years, and there's the we are here now to contribute more to the development of this beautiful country. Um, so we have been working with decision makers of multinational organizations from around the world on a daily basis, which has given us a chance to have a complete picture and to compare the human resources management in a diversified uh, set of industries and also countries around the world. Um, so we mainly work with uh, multinational enterprises for the reassessment of their current human capital, the company culture, everything going on there. Um, so we also work with uh, the foreign development in Southeast Asia in general, and in Vietnam in particular. Uh, we assist the newly development uh, companies with FDIs to set up the company here, as well as uh, building up their team in Vietnam. Um, so talking about our main philosophy, uh, we have to say that HR is uh, human resources is everything related to the take care of the aspects related to people, while human capital is broader. It means the people, the asset to the company, it is much broader and deeper thing. So organizations have to understand the organizational development and many things as a whole. So talking about our main philosophy, the human capital is not only about HR, but about organizational, organizational management as a whole. And which means we have to fight people in the right way, we have to retain people in the right way. And also it's important to pay and manage people in the right way. Um, so as I have mentioned before, we work closely with the multinational organizations. So our activities, including working, visiting the clients, and analyzing the companies to understand different organizational aspects. Um, so we did a, an, an, like an analysis with our five main companies, uh, our five main clients, and uh, we observed them. And today we will show you the results that we have found through the three time spans. Um, so we did a research in general with our set of clients and picked out the five representative companies to look into more detail. Um, the goal of this research is to figure out the common patterns related to the human capital management among the companies. So the methodology we used here was a uh, qualitative investigative research over the three time spans. The first one is uh, our observ observation in 2020. And the second one is just before the last COVID-19 wave. And the third one is during the last COVID-19 wave. Um, so firstly, let's, let's look into the sectors that the rep representatives are operating in. So they represent the three sectors which are, which are trending in Vietnam these days, which are the manufacturing sector, the IT sector, and the professional service sector. Um, so the object of our research is to figure out if there are any common managerial fears and problems related to the people productivity, how they can generate some new products. Uh, and then we will see, uh, we see how the style of leaderships has changed and all new types of leaderships has been applied to motivate and manage the key resources in the organization throughout the three time spans. And we did this um, to objects by the surveys and also the one-to-one -one direct talks with our, our clients. And uh, we also uh, investigate uh, our clients' approaches to innovation, if they have created any new processes uh, and uh, develop any new products or services throughout these three time spans. Um, so the, uh, our findings are quite interesting because there are uh, actually some common patterns among the uh, um, all the participants. Um, there are actually some similar change, change challenges and perceptions as well across the three time spans before, during, and after COVID. Um, 
those challenges are pretty the same across the most companies. So yeah, um, I think that um, the challenges are very worth uh, addressing and um, it's a big issue for the companies these days. So Mr. Giuseppe will talk about more about the trends and the results that we have discovered. And um, also we are ready for any Q&A session at the end as well. So I would like to develop, um, deliver this to Mr. Giuseppe. Thank you. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, thank you. First of all, Chung for the introduction. Um, I'm very, very happy to, to be here uh, today because uh, this is something we, we uh, have been studying for a while and uh, it's definitely for us, um, let's say, something we care about. Um, I hope you can see the screen well. Uh, just a second. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, we had the two possibilities today. Um, one possibility was simply to tell us, you know, with each other, uh, how things are going in this moment. And uh, the introduction of, of Mr. High was was very really good um there is no point to tell us how difficult is this moment um and uh, it's also sometimes difficult to talk about human resources in a period like this because when you are struggling with a specific organizational decision the last thing sometimes you want to think about is how to hire new people or how to organize uh, the people inside your organization but uh, let me say that uh, this is the real reason why um, we are talking about it today. Because this is the mistake uh, that uh, any manager, any leader, uh, we did it in our organization, uh, did uh, during a period of uh, like that. Uh, in my case, specifically, I'm living this period twice because I lived a lockdown in Italy uh, in March 2020 that lasted for a couple of months. And uh, the organizations uh, uh, I'm uh, managing in Vietnam have been leaving this already uh, for a while. So um, I live and I know exactly what are the issues with it. And I learned something. And uh, I'm, I was happy to see that what I learned is uh, also what we discovered with our uh, partners and organizations during this period of analysis. Um, and let me say that something, it's a surprise for me. Um, something else, it's something that I already knew, but uh, talking with other managers, talking with other leaders, I figure out also that um, it, uh, any problem can be seen from different perspectives. So in general, in general, just to summarize all the inputs we received um, in those talks we had with those multinational uh, located within a uh, Hanoi and, and, and Ho Chi Minh City um, is basically everything summarizable in two main trends, two main trends that are happening right now. Uh, at the end of the, of the webinar, I would be curious to see um, which ones you feel uh, happening in your organization. And uh, I would like to, to, to share your, your experience also with us because it's very interesting. This is a moment where everyone needs everyone, okay? Uh, so please share any, any, any experience you might uh, have done. But the two trends, we like it to identify with two slogan, okay? Two slogan that represents uh, those, those things that are happening today. The first one is no one is the smartest in the room, okay? No one in this, the smartest in the room means that exactly everybody needs everybody today. One of the, of the mistake that we do when we are in a situation like this one is that um, we tend to put our attention to control, to a safe path of actions in terms of uh, managing, in terms of uh, uh, choosing uh, um, what activities to do, prioritizing 
um, a strategy towards another, sometimes we don't even do strategies because what strategies you can do in a period where you don't know what is going to happen in a month from now. So in this situation here, the real difference is to try to um, find a way to make a difference. And people can be very useful for that. Imagine all our employees, imagine companies that, because uh, you know, in this period, there is really no big difference if you have a small company or a big company, you're all living the same problems. The same problems is that people are at home. People are at home. So they are not supposed to be where they should be when they work. Uh, if you see the history of work, work has always been something related to a labor activity uh, handled in some place, you know? Uh, imagine the time when you leave the morning your house, then you take your motorbike uh, or your car, and then you reach your office. That period of time there is fundamental. It's fundamental because you think about the day. It's fundamental because you can refresh your energies, because you are changing your position from being an husband, a father, a boyfriend, a son, a daughter, a wife, and you are becoming something else because you are going to join a place where you are, is requested for you to do something. Now, this doesn't exist anymore. There is no any more differentiation of place. So what happens in those periods? We try to see if there were some differences between managers, uh, C-levels, uh, operation people, younger, older people, and we notice similar patterns. What all of this is bringing us to companies today is tiredness. People are more tired. It seems a paradox because you are in your home, uh, you have everything available around you, but you are more tired. Why you are more tired? You are more tired because you are more pressured to follow uh, a path of task of activities that is required to do from your job and that you know that your managers, your supervisors are controlling more than before because they are scared. They are scared you might not be efficient as you think. So you are much more tired. It's a digital tiredness because you're always in front of your laptop and you have all relations handled by a screen, but it's also a mental and a physical tiredness. When you are tired, what happened? Happened that you are much more focused on the ordinary and much less focused on the extraordinary. So all your attention, all people attention, now, all workers attention uh, is about doing what is their duty to do. Compliance, okay? Complying to the job. This makes us also feel more lonely, more lonely for the workers, but also for the leaders. Leaders because they have difficulties in communicating with the people, have difficulties in sharing a vision, in sharing a strategy. And people more lonely because they feel far from their colleague, they, they have more difficulties in raising their voice, and they are uncertain of what is going to happen to them. Uh, remember that complying with an activity that is what usually managers are looking for in a period where resources are limited and uncertainty is high, is different than looking for commitment. I can comply towards a job, but I cannot be committed towards the job. And in that difference between complying to be committed, it's all the difference that we will try to analyze today because there are some ways to keep the commitment high. We all talk about hiring, but uh, hiring is not a science. When we're gonna find new people, we are gonna simply use with those people the same methodologies of management we are using with the people we have in the company. So before talking how to look for new people, it's really important to understand how to relate with our key people at least, with the people we think are an asset for our company, retaining them. Because this is one also one of the issues that in Vietnam is usually more felt by leaders and managers, especially foreign ones, when they come to Vietnam. Because the pool of talents, the pool of candidates is considered, is perceived to be high 
No, you know that you're going to find the person that you want sooner or later in a way or in another. But it's very complicated to keep the people that we want. And this, in this period of time, this is a key issue for the future of our organization. But let's see it in detail. Um, one of the main, main concerns that leaders, managers had when we talk to them is, please, please, uh, let me know how is my productivity. We measure the productivity. Okay, so I want that my people don't lose productivity. I want that my company don't lose efficiency. Okay, well, let me say this very, very clear to everybody. Productivity is not a problem today. It seems a paradox. It seems counterintuitive, but it is not the problem you need to be focused on. All the indicators we have tell us that productivity in period like this one doesn't change much from before, from a normal period of time. Um, please, let's really be strict on how we talk, when we talk about productivity and when we measure productivity. What is productivity? Productivity is the amount of work that I generate in one hour, okay? So one hour, it's a standard measuring time. But if you want to enlarge it is take whatever span of time you want, a week, a month, Okay, how many things you can do in that span of time that measure your productivity as an individual, as an organization, as a group of organization, as an industry and as a country. So for me, to macro, the measure doesn't change. This type of uh, measure didn't change also during pandemic and doesn't change now during lockdown. Why it doesn't? It doesn't because... As we said before, people are much more focused to comply what they have to do. So they do their job, they perform their job exactly, literally, as it asks them to do. This means that the efficiency increased, increased because also imagine if you, if you need to have a, a meeting, right? Instead of moving to another room, you just need to click a button. So the amount of activities that you have are higher, you manage to fit more activities in a span of time, and the losses of time are, yes, are up to you, because you can decide if you want to be focused or not focused on your job, you are more tired, but tendentially they don't reduce, okay? Which is the bad news in this? The bad news is that productivity doesn't change things. Being more productive or less productive is not a game changer indicator. Productivity is the baseline, is the baseline. It's like to have the engine if you want to run the car, okay? But then you need a good driver, you need a comfortable seat, you need good gears, you need uh, uh, aesthetics also. So when you're driving a car, there are many elements that count. Productivity, when you run a company, is your engine is the baseline. And now we need to look at the baseline because we have a moment where baseline counts. So be safe with that. Productivity is okay, but is not a game changer indicator. There is another indicator that is a little bit less uh, considered when we, we see at our organizations, when we talk with our people and we decide how to manage them, that is competitiveness. is an indicator that is usually used for macro scenarios. For example, when I want to analyze a competitiveness of a country to over another one, but is something that we can translate in our organization. Uh, to talk about productivity, this graph is a lab of productivity of Vietnam from 2018 to 2020. How productive, so amount of Vietnam dong produced in an hour of work from 2009 to 2020. Okay, you can see there were periods with peaks, ups and downs, but look the span, look just the, the data at the beginning of the, of the graph, 2009, and the one at the end. We are more or less there. 10 years of change, incredible growth of a country, incredible investment, a lot of new companies, FDIs facilitated, flexibilities of the labor market, and productivity, didn't change much. He reduced it a little bit, but more or less is the same. Why is that? 
because productivity is not a game changer. Productivity is not a good mirror of how our company is going or how our country is going or our organization is going. It's just a minimum valuable acceptable parameter. Let's talk about competitiveness. Competitiveness is much, much broader. The World Economic Forum measures the competitiveness considering 12 indicators. Okay, so what they do, they go to one institution in each country in their analysis, usually are between 140 to 144 countries analyzed in the world. Uh, in Vietnam, the institute in charge of uh, collaborating with the World Economic Forum every year uh, for showing the results of competitiveness of Vietnam is the Ho Chi Minh Institute for Development Studies. So what they dis discover, they discovered that 12 indicators are related to infrastructure, are related to technology investment, are related to health, are related to perception of safety, and many other elements that go from uh, our institutions to our micro life and way in which we perceive our micro life every day. All those 12 indicators, and this is the key point I would like you to take away from this, are relational indicators. It means that in order to be competitive, you need institutions, you need other countries, you need good politics, you need good managers, good leaders. Oh, now, move it from a country to your organization. Your organization, to be competitive, needs to put people together in touch. Need to let people work together. Because competitiveness measures how much your company maintain as a potential to bring innovation, to be innovative. Being innovative is the only way that your company today has to win over the competition. So if you want to win over your competition, you don't need to be more productive. That's a consequence. That's a good intention, but can bring towards bad consequences. But you need to try to be more competitive. To be more competitive, you need to create situations, investments, uh, activities that might be a resource on which you can count so now you understand the point. In a period in which people cannot stay together, in which we need to keep social distance, in which we are forced to be at home, in which leaders and their first line or employees cannot talk, in a way in which they could, they cannot meet to go to get a beer, to understand the emotions, the feelings, the way of thinking of someone. The fear increases because I cannot understand if that key resource is going to leave. Okay, on one sense. But on the other side, also, people are less in communication with each other. So the real problem of period like this one is to be less innovative, to use our resources not to be competitive enough. Vietnam, as a country, is a very good in terms of competitiveness. The, the, the rate of growth is very good can compare it with Italy, with in all parameters, is still above Vietnam in terms of competitiveness, but the rate of change is the opposite. Italy lost, uh, I think, three positions between 2019, 2018, this, this uh, range time is not the right one because the last counting was 2020, but between 2018 to 2020, we lost three positions. Vietnam, you will see now in the next slide, we covered 10 positions in one year. So Vietnam, as a country, as a cluster of institutions that collaborate with the competitiveness of the country, increase of 10 positions in one year. Today is 67 overall score. The human capital is measured with two elements, the health and the skills. So when we talk about human capital, we don't need to talk only about what I need to fill my job position. But you see that there is a part related to the well-being to the well-fitting of the human capital within my organization, okay? So in a country level, you see that Vietnam has a good asset of competitiveness. 
which is the real problem in periods like this one, that if they last too long, they are bad for competitiveness. Because in general, the en environment policies um, require investments. To require investment, they require specific policies that come from big organization and government. They require investment of human capital. They require go to a broad market, open new businesses, generate dynamicity in your business, and they require innovation. All of this can happen if things connect with each other. On a macro level, if you cannot travel, it's a problem. On a micro level, in your organization, if the key people cannot speak with each other and they cannot meet as they could meet, if you cannot push them in a room and uh, let them stay there for an hour to generate a new idea, then there, there, it's the problem you must solve today. And this will impact a lot on your hiring strategies as well. And we will arrive to that really soon. So no one is the smartest in the room, we call this trend, because no one is alone making a difference on competitiveness. You need people together. Um, those are the four outputs. They need to be physically together to produce more innovation. If they are not physically together, you as a leader and as a manager are more focused on individual performances and the individual performance that you see when you are on the other side of the screen is how many activities is doing. Is, is losing time. If it's not losing time, I'm happy enough. No, I'm focusing on the efficiency. But I'm not aware sometimes that that is the minimum valuable request in a period like this. So what happens? Happens that I'm willing more to lose a person to save the task that that person is doing. A person becomes more replaceable. Why? Because you are not focusing, you are not measuring, you are not KPIing the person. You are KPIing and you are controlling that the business as usual keep flowing as it was before. So your focus is on the task and not on the people. This is a big risk for talents. It's a big risk for key people because they don't feel motivated. They don't feel appreciated. They don't understand if you have a vision for tomorrow. And so they struggle in committing. We said at the beginning, complying with a job is different than committing with a job. And today we have a high level of compliance because everybody wants to agree that we need to be controlled, but at the same time, we need to produce what is requested from us, but it's very difficult to commit. And there is the play to game, the game to play our, our difference. It also, and this was very evident uh, uh, insight we got, uh, there is a perception for managers and leaders to reduce the capability to identify a talent and to retain one. Retaining, we explain it why, but even to identify one. Because um, our attention is really on the frame, on the job description that we need for our organization to move on. So if it's uh, Mr. Giuseppe, Mr. Chung, or Mr. Hai to do the job, we don't care too much. We care the job to be done. This one, this one can make us more blind towards the single potential that a person can do today. In a moment in which I also don't have high possibility to invest in people, I need to pay a lot of attention, maybe in young potentials. But to need to give attention to young potential, I need to play on a, my card, my jolly card, that cannot be controlling them. Cannot be controlling them. It must be something else. And we will see what. Okay, but this is very, very important trend. Difficulty to identify a talent. But let me say, there is one talent that we all forget about for whatever reason. That is not the talent of our people, but it's the talents of our organization. Also, organizations, companies have a talent. Their talent is what they are good at. Uh, all the leaders we talk in these three spans of time, they feedback us are 
real loss in perceiving um, what the organization is good at. So losing the awareness of the organization, which means that they cannot understand anymore what could be my core asset to win again the competition, or at least to survive in my market. This is something that organizations are struggling to do today. It's very, very difficult for any man, for any organization of any, of any type, of any size, of any industry, some more, some less, to understand what are the key assets that I cannot lose investing on. If I need to throw, you know, the, the tower game, if you have two things on the top of a tower, which one will you throw from the tower? You need to make, you need to make a choice. You need to select. The most important one, you keep it with you on the tower. The least important one, you need to throw it out of the tower. Organizations now, leaders, struggle in understanding that. What is the thing that I want to keep with me on the tower? Where the essential of my business, the core, the things I'm good at, the things I need to preserve are. And to understand that, there are some tips that we will see soon, but people play a crucial role in that aspect. The second trend, we call it save yourself if you can. It's safety, safety. Everybody wants safety now, okay? This is a good thing because we feel unsafe on a way, on a way and companies have families also that now are mixed in same, in same uh, physical places have a good role for that. However, there are some things we need to pay attention to when we talk about feeling safe. Is that nobody wants to make the first moment. If there is an idea to share, nobody share it. I close my microphone. Hmm? Today, you can close your microphone. You understand how powerful can be that action. If you are in a room physically with other people and nobody speaks, you tell them, please tell me something, or you see their body language. You cannot do it. You need to turn off your microphone and that's it. You don't have perception. Nobody wants to make a first move. Nothing moves. Things keep going as they were going yesterday. Baseline, safety, okay? Nobody wants to take risk. Uh, the amount of, of risks, decision. When we talk about risk, we don't talk only about investment or how you use your money. We talk even on a lower level, making decisions, important decisions, decide uh, promoting a person, or rather than decide to, to mix two teams together to generate uh, a project, let them work together, for instance. This type of micro decisions, we don't do them. We don't do them because any movement can be risky. So better to be safe. And so we don't make that any type of decisions. These are very dangerous, dangerous uh, uh, elements that we are encountering today, which we sometimes we are not aware of if we don't go, if, we are, if there is no someone that can tell us, look, pay attention to that. And this is the role we would like to have today, putting you back to your work, paying attention to that. Because if you are paying attention to that, you will see that automatically you generate a vicious circle that has a bad impact in retaining the people and finding and even in being more convincing when you need to find good people in the market. What is the consequence of this? Three main consequences. First one, um, your people feel that there is a lack of leadership. Why? Because you don't communicate about the future. You don't say anything about how you see your companies in two years, in five years from now, because you are not focusing on that. You are focusing on keep the boat sailing, surviving. But what about the future? Good people, remember this rule, the real good people don't look for a job, okay? The real good people are looked from a job. It's the job that look for them. The real, good people in our organization so now let's go inside what we already have so we talk about retention they want commitment commitment they don't want compliance 
to commit, they need to have an idea of the future that you have. They need to feel leadership. They need to feel a vision from now to the next five years. And this lack of leadership is unfortunately something that today, in moments like this one, we risk to let spread in our organization. Second consequences, we control more of the people, but what about trusting them? What about doing a counterintuitive action? I trust you. I'm not gonna check if you work eight hours today. I'm not gonna measure on the amount of tasks you will be able to deliver. Of course, this change industry to industry, but tendentially keep it as a general rule, as a principle to follow. If you are controlling your people, you trust them less and they feel it. You think that they don't feel it, but they know. They feel less trust. So the best way to act in this moment is trust them more. How to do it safely, that's the challenge. That's what we will say now. But be aware that too much control can be a counterback. Third element, family play a key role now. Why? Because we are more stressed from the job. We feel more controlled. We feel less powerful with our people if we are in decision-making position. We make less decision. Family are with us, probably leading the same situation with their job. The only way is to find in them a new way to, to, to let's say, uh, uh, feeling happier, okay? There is a problem of happiness in general. But this gives to family, so to personal context, a responsibility that they usually they didn't have because they were not used to be the stress, um, the stress test that you had in your work because they were two separate environments, two separate worlds. Now they are one environment. So your family is leaving a responsibility that usually uh, is not their job to fill. This can create personal problems. A lot of hiring problems you will find from now to the next year when things will slowly go back to normal is the personal history of the people. They have personal family decisions because we are going to have a, a, a credit towards our families, but families are going to have a credit towards us. We will need to give them something, in, something back. So probably it's going to be more difficult to see people moving from their hometown. Probably we will get used to a type of uh, remote working approach that uh, um, maybe is not what companies will look at uh, further. But this is given by what is going on now. And there is a way to change. There is a way to impact positively on this. So our message is communicate more as leader. Try to have good cameras on your, on your laptop because it's important to look people in the eyes. I, I don't know if you noticed, but when I have Zoom meetings with, uh, with uh, my teams, uh, I'm in Italy now, they are in, uh, in, in Vietnam. It's very difficult if they don't have camera on to understand if they are on the page, you know, if they are following you in the process. It's very difficult also to understand their emotional concerns if you don't see people in the eyes. And... Uh, look at them in the eyes, try to put them as much as you can together and as much as you can make them hear your voice and see your eyes too. So good communication and good comments, please. What we keep from all of it, two scenarios, when we need to hire someone, when we need to retain someone. When hiring, uh, take a moment, okay? And try to understand, try to, to go a little bit backward and see, okay, listen, I'm organization, I'm in, the, in this industry in 15 years, what I'm good at, what are the main values I'm based my business until now? Okay, now let me be very good in talking about those values. Let me be very good in defining, designing a vision for the future. Speak it, speak it out. Once you do that, once you do that, you have a convincing environment for any good people you want to find out there. Because again, people, especially in moments like this one, don't want to change their job, but they are scared to be in the job they are because they feel compliant and not committed. So when they will look for a job again, when the level of market will start very fast again, 
then you need to be able to, to give them commitment and not compliance, to give them a vision and not a job, to give them a culture and a set of values they can fit in, okay? That's why we need to be able, in moments like this one, when we do a recruiting activity, this is one of our mantra, but it's even more valid today, not only look for the good people, look for the most fitting with your organization, with the moment in your organization is, with the culture of your organization, with the personality that the boss has, with the personality that the other team member have. Because today, these elements that are personal impact a lot on the decision of a key person if choosing company A or company B, okay? The tangible value of salary becomes less important. Uh, more deeper value are in game than the career. And we need to play on those deeper values. Uh, seek for background diversity. Look, this is a general managerial rule that is valid since 1950s, okay? But today, today we cannot forget about it. The real, real greatness in organizations, in teams, happens when you have a background diversity. What means? Means that if I have a group of people, okay, let's there are some social experiment with that. If I give to a group of people composed by four male coming all by the same industry, and I give an, the same task to a group of people where I have two females, two male, all of them of different age, and each one coming from a different industry, and I give them a task, okay, you will see that the second team, so the most diverse one, will perform better than the first team. Why? Because background diversity brings, brings that element that we saw before that we are losing today, competitiveness, innovation. Because you have different point of view to address a problem. While you are in a moment of complexity and uncertainty like this one, it's very important to look for background diversity. So if I can give you an advice is, if you need to hire someone, don't look at where industry is coming from, how good he knows that industry. Look at that aspect, but don't limit yourself to that. I'm seeing that because one of the big tendencies in Vietnam is to give too much emphasis to the knowledge of the industry. It's important, but it's not the most relevant element. Okay? And this is because, and this is the third point, something absurd that we do as leaders. We look at CVs and we make decisions on the CVs. We make decisions looking at the piece of paper that they bring us in front of our eyes. So if that person is good experience, it's okay. I choose it. Maybe I like how he speaks. Perfect. Perfect. Done. That person is hired. But have you ever thought that that is like judging if someone is good, is good in driving by looking at his driving license? It's the same thing. We choose if we want to have a ride with a person, looking at the driving license. How many accidents he has? Zero. Okay. How many years is driving? Five. Perfect. I choose him. The other one, one year driving license, two, two accidents, no good. This is not really a good approach. It's not really a good approach, especially in a moment in which you need to really hire with preciseness, attention, and careness for your investment in human capital. Do a ride first. Instead of looking at the driving license, tell him, okay, bring me from here to here. Let's have a simulation ride. Then you can understand how that person behaves with the traffic, how that person reacts to an accident because accident can happen. And you can see really if he's a good driver or not. There are ways to do that when you're hiring someone. There are simulations, there are all game, there are assessment of people put it in competition with the other in groups assessment. There are individual assessment, but you have the responsibility to go in depth. Don't rush in hiring decision because you must fill a job position. Try to find the right person. To find the right person, you need to go beyond the job position, beyond the experience. You need to have a ride with that person. You need to simulate and assess that person 
before choosing it. And when you need to talk about the perspective you give them, I will never forget, I will never uh, be tired to repeat that. Communicate, trust, not safety. And I repeat it also when we talk about retaining. Communicate, trust, not safety. This is a valid rule when you hire people and when you need to retain your best people. When you need to retain your best people, another very important thing is create your laboratory. Give them the possibility to generate new products, new processes, to change policies, create some company challenge. What I'm doing in an in, uh, in IT company I manage in Vietnam is to give them challenges to generate new product based on few insights that I give them. This is bringing some very good results because people feel that are participating to a progress, to something that is progressing. They feel important. And good people want that type of environment. So create your laboratory. Test, when you can, the creativity of them. Put the creativity in challenge and give possibility to people that never lead before to lead, to see which style of leadership they have. You, as a leader, have a great responsibility when you talk with your key people, with your best people. You don't need only to be the coach. You need to play the game. In moment like this one, in moment where we don't know if we're going to survive tomorrow, we need bosses that makes their hands dirty. So go in the game, play the game. People learn much more from observing you. So when you communicate your vision, you don't need only to tell them a nice story. You need to go back to the world to work and play the game. Realize that future, make it happen, work with them, get micro tasks that usually in your job you don't get because you have a high seniority. This time go lower. You need to, you need to ask them a report, you ask your team a report, make the report with them rather than asking them the report and see if they report on time, they do the report on time or how well they do the report. Put your hands in the, in the jam and do yourself the report with them. This is a way that uh, helps people and especially the people you care about to remain and believe in your organization. So there is no great, great science behind all of this uh, for all of you. But it is important to be aware, aware that those are micro elements that happens every day in our organizations. And then we don't see. And when we don't see, in moments like this one, they explode. And they become bombs that we cannot address later. So try to understand where is your organization baseline? What are the main traits of your people? Which personality they have? If you want to hire someone, what will be the best fitting one? What is the general problem of productivity you have, if you have any? But you don't forget about innovation and competitiveness. Try to choose the people before trying them. You can try them in inserting a trial period inside the hiring process, not after the hiring process. You can do it with simulations. You can do it with assessment. In general, uh, be aware of this. We as Vinaxia are available to help organization to do this uh, with one-to-one -one talks, with whatever insights you might require from us because we see organization every day. Uh, if there is some of those points that I told you today that you feel might be underestimated by you or that you realize that when you go back to work and you close this webinar, actually our problems, are actually our best bad practices you are putting into action, we are available to give any type of insights that can be useful because we believe in, uh, in uh, uh, really in the possibility to create from moments like this one, great uh, opportunities. So if you have any Q&A, we are available. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe, for your very interesting and uh... That's a very insightful uh, presentation. And we hope that uh, the information provided by FAR is uh, somehow or provide the useful information for you. And right now, uh, with no further, I'd like to go directly to the Q&A part that we have been receiving quite uh, amount of number for the question. 
So the first question we uh, receive is, um, can you talk specifically about Vietnamese worker and labor situation now during the lockdown? How are Vietnamese people doing now? Um, um, well, do we do one by one or do you make a list of questions first? No, no, we do one by one. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, so, you know, uh, it's difficult to answer this question if you don't make some differentiation between industries and companies because what we have done in this webinar is to identify some trends. You need to simplify and summarize, you no know, general patterns. But it's important then to go in the specificity of each industry and each in each organization. Uh, what I've noticed and what we see is that um, Vietnam has always been in the last few years a very dynamic labor market. People go, people leave, very easy. I can compare it to what happened to Europe. Um, and, uh, and in general, this is a good thing, okay? It is an indicator of a healthy economy because there are opportunities. Mm. Um, but uh, one of the problem is that uh, those people now that maybe two years ago were in the, or one year ago, they were willing to, to change uh, a job, they keep two, three, four weeks more to think about their decision, if it's the right moment to do it or not. So there is more static labor market in general. But this means that, uh, this means that the good people are actually know that they will have the same chance to change than before. So they keep living. And the one that are maybe uh, less potential, let's, let's simplify it in that way, they stay. So in longer term, you have a situation where the people you will, you will not like in your company remain and the people that you will like in your company leave. Because when this moment will, will, be, will be changed, um, then if you're not able to commit, to make commitment towards them, they will leave. So one of the, one of the uh, aspects now, one of the focus now should not be how can I look for good people? One of the focus now should be, first, let me understand who are the best I have now, right now. Let me see how can I defense, now having a defensive approach. How can I defend myself from the attack of other companies that might steal those people from me? So let me understand how can I commit them more? And what we talk today goes in this direction. Then if you want to go in the market there outside, as I said, uh, a change that is happening now is that people, especially in Vietnam, because Vietnam is leaving this situation now, is uh, to pay less attention to tangible benefits like career certainties, salaries, um, or, or variable parts, but they give more attention to what we usually call company benefits, which are the type of insurance you provide them, the type of free time you provide them, the, the amount of remote working you provide them. Because now those are the values that we are getting used to and that we perceive as part of our life. Uh, so people are mixing much more work and life than before. And so the value in game are much more and companies must be prepared to be attractive in that sense. Yeah, thank you. So the second question we have is, um, uh, is it very difficult to hire the project sales personnel able to perform well? What very are the main difficult. incentive, the benefit would attract very. the right candidate? I the agree side, totally. Yeah, the I agree. company, local foreign training availability, salary commission, for example. Good, good, good point. First of all, I agree on the problem, no? which is uh, already because we need always to start from that, how much we agree with the, with the problem stated by the question. I totally agree with the problem. I always struggle in uh, my six years of experience in Vietnam to um, hire good salespeople um, for very strange uh, reasons. And I, I don't even know which are 
those reasons. But I have some ideas, but they are just my, my personal hypothesis. But it's very difficult to find good salespeople in Vietnam. Uh, so the commercial strength, uh, it's difficult, especially if you look for Vietnamese, local Vietnamese. Uh, my personal explanation, and then I answer the question, but my personal uh, explanation for that is that um, a lot of sales processes in companies are very, very standardized. So if you uh, follow the checklist, you have a good sales performance. Okay, when you need to find a new clients, company have checklists. Call 20 clients per day, uh, rather than write uh, uh, email in that way, uh, and how many of them. So a salesperson is a person that must implement checklist, full stop. Okay. In Italy, for example, in Europe, there is much less approach to a checklist way of doing sales activities is much more relational, the type of sales, is much more based on network that the person has on all level, junior level, middle level, and senior levels. In Vietnam is a question about how good you are in implementing checklists. And this means that people that do sales are usually people that are not, they don't have the, the habit to improve competencies because it's not required much from them while there is a lot of competencies that those people should have. Uh, sales activity is full of soft skills. It's full of soft skills that you should train, not only ability to implement certain checklists or do a demo to a client of a product. Um, this is very important because sometimes we underestimate that. So the real problem is that there is not good qualified sales people because we want something more but what we are offering them is just checklist to implement so my advice to to to, to change this is first of all uh, really test their soft skills when you find a salesperson focus less on how many clients they were able to get in the previous company because probably that is not due to their abilities but due to how good the checklist the previous company had but pay attention to the soft skills and specifically three soft skills. One, ability to um, generate personal connection. So how good is that person in generating personal connection? Second soft skills is extroversion. Uh, introvert people are good in implementing checklists. Extrovert people are good in implementing checklists, but they cannot be evaluated in the same way if you're doing a sales job. Third element is the motivation that they have behind, okay? Because unfortunately, especially for junior sales, sales is the first job you find, okay? You are fresh from university or maybe it's, uh, it's one year you are working. It's the easiest job to find because not nothing much is required from you. The fixed part is low, the variable is high. Companies have less risk in hiring a salesperson because they have the variable, the variable part. And so it's less risky for them. Uh, this brings people to be in a, in a vicious circle because they never had the possibility to train themselves. So try to understand if there is something solid behind the person, how much culture he has, how much knowledge he has, how much knows management organizations. Try to test these elements because they are fundamental. And this is also my suggestion for the salespeople. Do training. If you find a course, if you look for a webinar like this one, if you have a mentor, try to look to become better person, better people, better professionals in general, not only better sales implementer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the next one, I believe, is uh, regarding to all of us. Uh, the question that all company has has in mind: um, how to find qualified personnel and how to keep them. Okay, uh, I can answer if you give me one million dollar, uh, <laughs> because it's it's the typical it's the typical one one million dollar question. Um, there is, look, if we if we keep looking for the magic formula in this world, uh, we are never going out of any solution. Okay, um, 
what we can do is first of all let's do one step backward as i try to say in the webinar let's first realize what we can do let's be very honest with our organizations with our situation and see what we can do there is a tendency in vietnamese market which is very rapid and very grow uh, very fast growing market in any market in any industry now uh, to look too much about competitors to look too much about what others are doing look at what others are doing look at competitors but don't forget what you can do so it means in hiring simple thing if i need a person that is good in managing a product development okay but my organization is an organization that is in a moment in which I'm doing, a, for example, and there are many organizations like this, a digital transition. So I'm not used to have digital products, but it's an year that I'm used with digital product. You need to find a person that is able to understand transitions, not only a person that is good in understanding how to develop a digital product, because the context in which the person will go is different context than the one probably is coming from. So the only advice I can give, because there is really no science in that, I'm sorry for, for the answer, but is depends. Depends and my advice is look for the person that is not only good at the job he needs to do, look at his CV, but try to assess that person before choosing it, before choosing the person and try to understand if that person is good for the specific moment that your organization, your organization is living. Because a good person in 2020 might not be the good person you are looking for in 2022. So first, look how much uh, perspective you want this person to act. If you want a person acting in short term and long term, where you want to go in two years from now, and uh, elements that go beyond his ability to perform the job. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's, uh, no. Um, I, I'm reading the question is, do you use physiognomy in hiring? If yes, could you share your experience using it? No, I don't use physiognomy. Um, but uh, what we usually use are uh, assessment that go from uh, personality tests. Okay. First of all, what is the use, usability of an assessment? An assessment is not used to understand that person 100% before you keep it in, because this doesn't exist. As I said, there is no magic formula, okay? Hiring is always a risky choice. Let's be clear with that. Uh, but assessment are the same as Google map when you need to reach a destination. So going in the street is completely different because you don't know the traffic, you don't know how many uh, uncertainties and emergencies you will need to deal with, but at least you have a map. Okay, so we try to have a map of the people before. How we try to have this map? We test them with personality tests to understand what are the main personality elements relevant in that person and the least one. Then we have several other tests, a value test um, where we let that person choose within 60 values, the five in which he fits the most, he likes the most, and the five he doesn't believe in. Then we have several other assessments that are physically done, not online. So with a person that is observing them while they do, which are the uh, GHB, that is an intelligence and problem solving test. Then we do several creativity tests. We do several tests to understand more about the history of the person. One test we use is called the uh, um, interrupted sentences. You know? So we call like, for example, uh, my relation with, uh, uh, for example, my father is dots, dots, dots. And we have uh, hundreds of questions like this. And we see then how the person fill those questions to understand if there are also some elements in the personal life of the person that can be some warnings or can be some green lights when we understand about the person. So we try to understand as much as we can. We don't use physiognomy because um, we believe that uh, 
there is nothing better than uh, than uh, human eyes and uh, talking and uh, uh, perceptions to understand people. Yes, the next question is uh, in Vietnam, especially in Ho Chi Minh City, is a huge gap in demand and resources during the COVID pandemic. There are a lot of jobs that need resources in technology, IT software, hardware, for example, but it's less job in the network and telecommunication. How about other industry? Which industry is less resources than job? Which industry is less job than resources now? Thank you so much. Uh, two or three uh, insights on this. So um, retail, so whatever is, um, is uh, retail um, has uh, less resources, more jobs. So there is a bit of overwhelming there. So people that come from uh, retail industry, whatever type of retail it is, it can be uh, direct to consumer or it can be um, towards uh, with resellers. Uh, but in general, retailers, people that come from retail, probably in the next few years will need to recollocate them somewhere else. So it's important to use this time to do upskilling, so-called so -called upskilling or uh, skilling updates where you need to look for uh, uh, new technical competencies that can be usable for you to reuse in other markets. Um, whatever is related to production, plants, uh, manufacturing, which are companies we, we, we deal with uh, um, recently, um they have instead more or less uh because in, in that industry the the uptrends and the downtrends are slower to show up okay so they are probably a bit a bit uh, late for leaving a proper crisis compared to other sectors uh so there there is more there are more resources now but there are few jobs available uh, also because sometimes those plants in Vietnam are located in areas that are few attractive for people. You know? uh, people want to live basically in Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh and Da Nang. Uh, whatever is far from those three, uh, it's a problem unless they don't have uh, hometowns close. But this is a big problem because the logistics uh, to find good people in plants is, is a problem. So there are more resources there than, than jobs. Um, what uh, uh, comes in my mind now is the IT industry. You know? It is an industry that I know also very well from, from, from my own experience. And uh, the IT industry is one of the pioneer industries for Vietnam. We know that. Uh, all related to technology and, and digital uh, products are, uh, are always, always in, in a good trend, let's say, for resources in the last few years. But let's pay attention to that because uh, do you know who is the main competitor for your company if you come from IT or tech industry uh, in, um, in Vietnam uh, uh, today? Is called Singapore. Okay, so Singapore is attracting a lot of good tech engineers from Vietnam. Vietnamese young and also more expert, good um, engineers are willing to travel more than before um, because of several changes that are happening in the culture, in the well-being, in the society, and etc. Uh, so this is, this is uh, uh, something to compete with because Singapore has much better negotiation power than Vietnamese organizations. And the last thing, uh, for younger position, for younger, uh, like fresh graduates or young talents, uh, what is happening is that uh, um, people that have good English, for instance, and that are quite well educated, they want to, they are maybe investing a bit more in education than before. Uh, before they were jumping into work more. Now you find a lot of young talents that prefer to, to keep uh, doing education, to maybe do a master in Vietnam or abroad. Um, there are a lot of universities in Vietnam that are having partnership with foreign universities, which increase for the well-being of the society and the opportunity that open 
a, a bit a bit of, of problems in hiring junior junior people uh, in general across all industries, especially in technology industry. So there you need to have uh, specific headhunting activities. Um, let me say hi to answer this question also that uh, I don't trust, I never trusted, but more we go forward with the time, uh, I less trust databases, okay? Uh, databases of candidates, because today databases are um, everywhere. Uh, LinkedIn is a database, Facebook is a database, Instagram is a database, you know? Uh, so uh, having uh, databases today doesn't bring too much value. What brings value is to choose the right person from the database. And, and then we should talk about that more. Yes. Uh, we have uh, one question that I believe uh, is very interesting. Um, Many companies are focusing on the happiness in the workplace or IQ and EQ right now. Maybe is it a trend or is necessary? That's why we have a new title, PPO. What do you think about it in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia? Okay, so uh, as we talk about productivity and competitiveness, um, we saw there are macro levels of country level and micro level, organization level. For happiness is the same thing. There are some studies about happiness uh, that periodically come out. And uh, on macro economies, on macro levels, uh, happiness is confirmed also from the most recent studies to be strictly related to the GDP and the GP, GDP per, per, per capita of a country. So countries that have higher GDP or higher GDP per capita are happier countries. Of course, happiness is a perception. So it's measured by qualitative analysis where you ask to a, a group of people how feel with several questions, but at the end of the day, how much they are happy or what they feel happy themselves. So until the general macroeconomic situation is good, people are more demanding in terms of happiness also in your organization because they can find easier that happiness anywhere else. So happiness becomes a competitive advantage. Happiness offered to an employee becomes a competitive advantage for an organization to hire a person or to retain a good person. Now, how to give happiness? Um, without going too much in philosophies, because happiness is an individual thing, but we can simply say that probably the key is um, to... I will simplify this way. Uh, let people feel important. You let them feel important if the people know that your organization care about them. How you can show them that you care about them is, first of all, invest in their training if you can. Use a bit of your resources to invest in the training of your people. Uh, don't let them go to train by themselves somewhere else. If someone um, do a basic thing, if someone doesn't speak good English and you are a, a foreign organization, don't tell them go to a, go to an English school. Try to understand how you can help. Maybe you yourself invest some of your time and do some private classes. Uh, so show them that you care about them with investing in their training. Second. Um, Give them uh, a general a perception of less control and more trust, we said in the webinar, but basically means adjust a bit your policies. Uh, for example, I will make you a concrete example of, of, of my IT company. There, we um, had a discussion with management about we should conceive remote working or not and how much no, per month. So we give them two, two remote working as a policy, uh, one remote working uh, and in which conditions. And many companies are addressing that problem now because remote working is becoming something that people actually are living on their hand. So my opinion on this topic of remote working is very simple. It's a no problem. It's a fake problem. Why? Because it's our perspective of controlling that makes that a problem. But for the people, it's a natural selection, means that if I let you work in your house or if I let you work 
under me, under my eyes in the office, and you produce results in both situations, then you are a good worker for me. So uh, the people that will not perform well from home means that are people that will not perform well, even in the office, when you uh, slow down with the control a little bit. So probably it's even a good way to select the people that will deserve to survive in your organization or not. So in my opinion, be very, very flexible and light with remote working policies. You can give them even one entire month for remote. Uh, it's not a problem. This is something that good people are look for. And if you want good people, and if we are talking about good people, good workers, then don't worry about let them work from remote. If they are good workers, they will perform anyhow. And you, you gain because you give them trust. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have two questions more for you and one for Chum. I would go, uh, the first one is, um, which are the skill and competence that the worker need to learn in order to be ready for the job after the COVID-19? And from the, let's say, C-level point of view, how could you do or what could you do to convince the board of director or the stakeholder to invest into your employee to learn those new skills? That's the first one. For who, for, 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 for who, for me or for Chum? For you, for you, for you. For you, for me, okay. Um, so uh, there are two questions in one, if I understood correctly, right? Yes. Okay. Um, let's start from the second one. How you convince your board? Uh, tough job. Tough job because uh, um, the, the if, if there is this question means that uh, uh, there are some bad practices already well, uh, uh, well embedded in the organization, which is the board, and there are many organizations like this, where the board live to the last floor of the building, but the life happens to the first floor of the building. So when the, the board lives all this time on the last floor of the building, and the life is happening on the first floor of the building, there is a problem because it means that the board doesn't know its organization. And as we said before, uh, knowing what the organization is good at before the knowing which people are good is the most essential starting point to even start having any hiring strategy. But if you are in that situation, my advice is try to create some type of uh, um initiative with a few key people people you are close to or people uh, you think are, are enough good uh, open in your company uh, possibly if you can from different areas so one person from the administration one person from uh, the marketing one person from the sales and so on and you let them uh, you give you give them a clear task and say please indicate three things that you would like to change in the company, you can give them a topic or you can be very free with exactly this open question. And then you let them propose ideas. You make them have a list of 10, 15 ideas. Then you go to your board and say, uh, our uh, people think that things might be improved in this way. And then you try, if you have a good uh, uh, communication negotiation skill with your board, to let them talk directly with those people. Um, if you do this once, two, uh, three, um, I believe, and that happens because I saw histories uh, like that, um, that the board becomes more aware of how much people can give when is required them from them to do differently, to do more uh, than what they're used to do every day. So the best way for an HR manager that doesn't have budget to hire new people is wait a little bit more, instead of keep asking budget for that, show to your uh, board, seems a paradox, but it's like this, how good are the people you already have? Because it's counterintuitive, I admit that, but it's like that. Because the first 
awareness that a board must have is the importance of the people. Once is get that awareness, then you will see that you will have more budget for training, for hiring, for empowering. Uh, sorry, hi, but you need to repeat me the first question of the two. Yeah, which are those skills or competence that the worker needs? Yes, uh, three. I, I would say three main. Uh, there are many, but I, will, I like three in particular. Um, so first one is to analyze business insights. So an uh, employee, or independently from its responsibility and its job, by having a balance sheet in front of him, must understand how to read it. Uh, so read economics, read economics of a company, uh, understand uh, uh, core drivers of a business, understand if that is a good business or that is not a good business by knowing which parameter to analyze. So uh, very pragmatic uh, fit on the heart of the business, so business insights. Uh, for example, I, uh, to, I give to some of my employees a course of accounting for non-expert, for not expert. So if you don't know anything about accounting, if you don't know anything about how to read balance sheet, um, you can have courses, there are courses for no expert. So this is very good because it really gives you in simple way the drivers to understand uh, economic, our economic count of, uh, of an organization. Uh, the second skill I would say is uh, um, ability to make, uh, this is more soft skills, but it's very important, uh, making decision. Making decision is more and more difficult. There are few people that are good in making decisions. Uh, so making decisions means critical thinking, means ability to understand trade-offs, um, uh, but also to be fast in doing that. Not analysis that last two years before deciding something, but at the same time, uh, having ability to choose the right parameters when to make a decision. The third one are all the, the, all the skills related to digital. So all digital skills today are a must have. So if I know how to use uh, tools that are able to efficientize a process, optimize a process, how good, I'm using to, to, uh, how good I am in using those tools is definitely a must have uh, competencies uh, today. Yeah, thank you, Giuseppe. Uh, this one is for Mr. Chu. Um, how to create a new office based working environment and how to deal with college that is like to stay at home, uh, to work from home. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ha. Mr. Ha. It's a very interesting question, by the way. Um, so, firstly, before we come into how we can build a, an office based environment, we need to understand why people like working at home more. We need to go to the course first. So maybe they like uh, wearing comfortable clothes. So that's one way you can imply to your company culture, just wear um, casual clothes to work. There's no need to wear like a shirt or like uh, trousers. Um, maybe at home they can um, um, do the task um, and then they can relax at the same time like um, they can uh, manage their own task in their way so there's no need for people to like um, go sit at the desk uh, all the time maybe you can have a fridge people can go and have some food at the break or maybe like when they are stressed they can go to the sofa and have a rest there for like a few minutes so that's uh, a few ways you can implement like um, so for big organizations for example like uh, Google they have like the whole team for people, they have PlayStation, they have a billiards table, football table, but those things are, 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 if they are quite expensive for your organizations, then you can implement like a simple things as a state, like the fridge or like the sofa or, or some, some other things that create like a, a an, um, I would say like a, a relaxing environment, environment so that they, the, your employees can feel like um, they are working like from home, just like uh, working from home. Um, so basically, um, you can um, like a few things that you can uh, implement as well. Um, for example, like if you are too tired of um, going into the meeting room and sit down together, having an, a stressive me meeting, then you can uh, implement the stand up meeting. Like it just takes uh, less, it, it is proven to be more efficient if, if you implement the uh, stand up meeting because no one wants to stand for too long. So they will talk about in a, a very efficient way and they will try to uh, shorten their um, meeting. 
So it will be more efficient and time saving as well for meetings. Um, yeah, I don't know if Mr. Mr. Giuseppe wants to add anything. Yeah. No, you said okay. everything. Yeah. <laughs> Thank great, you. great. Thank you. I'll, I'll go only for for two more questions uh, before closing our, our webinar today. Um, the first one uh, is the, uh, for long distance recruiting, particularly for a uh, multinational company expanding to Vietnam. What are the main criteria for choosing the right person when we uh, or when they could not travel to Vietnam at this moment? Thank you. Uh, okay, when we, uh, if we, if we decide as an organization that we want to use assessment to understand the person well uh, before choosing the right person means that we decided an approach. The approach is I will look at the CV, but I will not stop there. Okay, so let's first agree on this approach because this is the baseline to make correct decisions. Now, if you have that approach and you are wondering how you can handle that approach while you cannot meet the people, which I think is the intention of the question, uh, it's more difficult, definitely. But at the same time, if you have a good methodology to do that, you can handle it. What we usually do, for example, as Vinaxia, when we do this job for other clients, that uh, sometimes approach us as a recruiting agency and then soon discover that our approach is not as a recruiting, um, a normal recruiting agency uh, because we are a bit weird people. But basically the point is this one. First, we try to understand the organization. So we spend uh, maybe uh, 20, 30 minutes, not only with the person that is giving us the job of recruiting, but also with the managers or with some head of the team of some colleagues which intentionally uh, in the intentions that person they are looking for will go to work with so try to understand and we try to understand uh, we try to assess those people uh, in a very light way but just to understand what are the main drivers is that team driven by result is that team driven by a uh, good atmosphere is that person uh, a person that is organized or is the is boss a person that is a bit less organized because at the end of the day you need to find someone that will work with someone and this is a key essential point for retention as well so you can understand those things if you have right methodologies that you can deliver also online what we do when we do these activities is to do it with an observer so the assessment is not done by i give to you a test send me back the results when you have done. No, an assessment is done. We connect on Zoom. I give you a test. You put the camera on. I put my camera on. You write in paper the things you must do. You ask me if you have any question. You make a picture of that, and then you send me right away. The observation is very important because when you have an interview, when you are doing an assessment, it's important also to see how responsive, how fast, how nervous certain people are on certain elements or not. So let's use Zoom, let's use Skype, let's use all the digital tools that we can use, but let's not stop only looking at CVs. And keep your camera on, please keep your camera on. If you have an interview, put the camera on. Not because we have, uh, as someone asked before, some specific te technology, to analyze the faces of people, but because by looking at the people, you understand much more about um, how they feel, simply that, how they feel in that moment with you. And you get a lot of insights from that. Yes, yeah, that's great, that's great. Thank you, Giuseppe. And the last question for you today is, um, let's say, uh, what are the root cause leading to low productivity of uh, Vietnamese in, uh, company, and not only the state-owned, but also in private company. Is it because of soft skill of labor force, or is it because of something else? Okay, as I try to explain in the in the webinar, there is no this problem in Vietnam. So, if someone tells you that your company is less productive than before, 
or if you think that your company is less productive than before, it's very possible following the trends that you are mistaking it. You are calling with the right name what you call productivity. Productivity is the amount of task that your employee is able to do in one hour. Working from home, tendentially people are more productive because they have less waste of time. So in general, average productivity didn't change. Actually, in some cases, improved. The real problem is not in productivity. The real problem is in long-term marathons, not in the sprints. The real problem is to keep that level high and to let it become a driver to let the organization grow and not only survive. To do that, you need to create occasions, occasions to let people collaborate. If people collaborate with each other, the productivity that you are talking about becomes a collective uh, goal. And that collective goal brings advantages on the whole organizational productivity. So if you think that you are, if, let's summarize, if you have five people and you give them five tasks and they give that five tasks in one hour, you are productive. But if you keep half an hour of that one hour to let those people do something that they usually don't do together, but that is a problem you want to solve and that can bring value to your organization, seems to you that you are managing towards less productivity. But in reality, you are offering more productivity because in that half an hour, they will find 10, 20, 30 outputs that will improve the re remaining half an hour they have. People feel it is related also to happiness, joy, and working environment, much more motivated to be productive in the way in which we are talking today about if they are put it in situation out of the comfort zone. And you need to risk. It's difficult. It's difficult to do in the moment like this, but you need to risk. If you don't take risks today and you are not willing to let people work on something that is independent from their tasks, you are surviving, but you're not growing. Honestly, if you ask me, you want to bet $1 in being stronger in 2022, if I knew that today I could collaborate to my growth in 2022, or you tell me, bet $1 in making sure that you don't draw the water, I will bet it on the first one. Because I prefer to invest in the future than to keep an eye on the present. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the last but not least, the very, very last question that we've just received, and I believe that this one uh, on our company as are struggling uh, overcome this is uh, how do you increase employee engagement during this uh, distancing period? Great. Um, uh, I will tell you with a story. Um, Around three weeks ago, I think three weeks ago, a month ago, more or less, I discovered, I discovered that uh, um, our employees uh, decided to open a SharePoint, a share space, a share uh, um, libraries, where they talk about um, the last book they read, okay? or they talk about uh, interesting articles they read or interesting movies they watched and uh, they created a private environment by themselves where they can exchange things to feel less alone. Um, I was very happy when I heard that because I, did, I didn't think about it and they thought about it. So the thing that, more, that made me more happy was this one. Uh, because it means that there is a culture in the company that uh, goes in that direction. So my advice is, uh, if you don't have that culture or you need time to build it, take the initiative. Create some uh, um, uh, moments in which people can meet online with the camera on again, uh, and they can share things that they will share at lunch uh, in the office. Um, when it, like if they were in the office. This is the only simple, very simple way to feel them engaged on, on, in terms of company life.
But if you want to, if you mean engagement on a higher level, as I said before, give them opportunity to speak out. Don't just control them. Trust them, reduce a bit the control in KPIs, increase the possibility for them to do new things for your organization. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just uh, like a few yes, things. Yes, please go ahead. Um, so talking about the, um, the, um, the, the things of sharing on the uh, private platform that Mr. Giuseppe has said, um, there are, so if, if we, we would like to uh, share on that, um, we could implement some strategies like, uh, for example, like uh, you share the book you have read, like Mr. Giuseppe said, uh, we share the, uh, our meals, for example, like how we cook. So a lot of people would like to share that. And uh, maybe we can uh, do some like video calls, like random video calls uh, with each other. Um, so one person will actually set up the pairs and then like uh, they will do the pair calling. So it's a good way as well because like, we keep the camera on, people still seeing people. So it's a good way of engagement as well. And um, there are many other, other activities we can do. For example, like uh, you can film your video doing some exercises at home to uh, prove your strength uh, against the COVID. And that, that, that can actually like um, doing like a uh, competition as well, like who can do the, the most push up, for example. Yeah. And um, talking about the, um, the, 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 um, the way people can speak out like um, um, in a more relaxing way, I think we can actually implement a more flat structure. So not too many hierarchies. So there, are, there will be like short distance between the manager and the like employee worker yeah so people are more relaxed to speak out whatever they think and their concern so that, that helps a lot in like uh, realizing the problems and sort them out very quickly especially during this period and we don't see each other yeah thank you thank you guys very much and uh so it has been one hour and 45 minutes passed by, and I would like to uh, give a big, big thanks to our speaker today, Giuseppe and Chung, for having again sharing with us their wonderful knowledge, wonderful experience, and also advice, tip um, to help our business, to help our company to, uh, let's say, overcome many different uh, difficulties uh, in this uncertainty situations. And uh, we also like to um, thank you to all the participants that are joining with us uh, in our webinar today and remain until the very end. Our webinar, as always, uh, as usual, will be available online on our YouTube channel within uh, maybe tomorrow or after tomorrow at least. And also the uh, presentation that is being used today by Giuseppe and Chung will be also available online so um thank you again thank you to all of you to joining our webinar and very looking forward to see you in our next one have a nice weekend good luck everybody bye Everyone. thank you stay safe, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Stay safe. bye